Story 1. The Nun. Submitted by One Heart. Greetings. My English isn't that good, so you'll forgive me. With that said, I'll begin. So I'll try my best to tell the story because English is my second language. This experience happened to me when I was younger, at this very house where I'm currently staying at with my mother and my second older sister's daughter. I was about seven years old when I first experienced this, and at the time my dad was away for work while my mother was on a trip with her sister. I come from a family of seven with me being the last born, four boys and three girls to be precise. However, when this happened, I was with only one of my siblings, which I will name Liz. At the time, the firstborn was married and moved to England with her husband. The second was at school studying law, while the third and fourth were in South Africa on a trip with their friends from high school. The sixth was at boarding school, so we only had the two of us to keep each other busy. The day went by fast and as nighttime steadily approached, some ray clouds could be seen in the distance. We had supper and I chose to stay up late watching Cartoon Network. I would always fall asleep on the couch, and if not my mother, one of my siblings lifted me up and took me to my room. But this time, since the bed was so comfy in my parents' room, I whispered telling Liz to put me there. Before I knew it, I was fast asleep and shortly after that, it had started pouring outside. I'm not sure what it was, but I was awakened by a smell. Not a smell of rotting meat, but a very strong smell of ash of some kind. I thought it was my dad's ashtray, so I was about to shrug it off, but something about this smell was different, and there was no way that the ashtray would produce such a strong smell. I'm Catholic, and I'm able to actually recognize what this smell was. It was the smell of incense. Take note that I wasn't fully covered, and I was laying flat on my stomach with my head facing away from the source of the smell. Being young, I really didn't know what exactly was going on, so I slowly scanned the room, which had no light, before my eyes finally found the source of the smell. Thinking about it now, my adult self would immediately tremble in fear if I was to experience everything again. But being a kid, it hadn't kicked in yet. What I saw was a nun of some kind. She seemed to be tall because I was not able to see her upper body. I was only able to see her chest area all the way down to her lower body. It hadn't yet registered that this person wasn't normal. I tried looking upwards to see the nun's face, but I couldn't. My body was unresponsive, but I wasn't afraid. It's like my body knew, but my mind didn't understand the situation. Before I could do anything, the nun's left arm stretched out, reaching for my right leg. The arm was dark gray in color and was covered in a thick dark green liquid, the nails black. She tightly gripped my leg, lifting it upwards, almost as if she was checking for something. Her hand was extremely cold. I swear I could hear sniffing as she bent down closer to my leg. Her face was close, but I dared not lock eyes with her. This experience must have been too much for me because I must have fainted, for I don't remember what happens next. I woke up early in the morning, where I quickly looked around my parents' room after calming down. I thought it was just a scary dream. I ran out of my room looking for Liz, who was downstairs making breakfast. I gave her a hug as tears poured down my face thinking that it was all just a scary dream, until my sister asked me a question that gave me so much fear. Were you playing with mom's incense last night? Twenty-ninth Dragon no author. Atop the salt-encrusted docks and piers of Seattle squats an ugly clappered shack, its windows smeared with grime and the walls draped in fishnets. The oil slick, an aptly named bar riddled with age and barnacles, but a sanctuary to the swarm of deckhands and sailors that spend their days scurrying across the rotting holes of ships and their nights slinking in a drunken stupor. It's a rough bar, where a careless comment will earn you a punch to the face and a long fall into the grimy waters below. On any given night, one can find an aged Chinese sailor curled up against the bar, 
a broad-shouldered old salt with a bulging gut and an empty stare pasted across his face. His name is Hao Ming, but to the regular flotsam of the pub, he is known as the Man of the 28 Dragons. 28 scaly tattooed reptiles twine sinuously across his arms and legs and twist menacingly across the bunched muscles of his back. Hao claims each dragon represents a crucial part of his life, stories transformed into ink. Buy him a drink and he'll be happy to share the thrilling tales behind each one, carefully describing how the dragon's color represents the joy, terror, love, loss, and death. Visit him 28 nights and buy him 28 drinks, and the powerful stories of his life will weave and merge before your eyes, until they resolve into the aging man drinking next to you. And then satisfied you will have exhausted his treasury of adventures, you'll excuse yourself and float onto the night, the light and noise of the oil slick bobbing away across the dark waves, and the man of the 28 dragons will finish his drink and clutch his faded shirt to his chest, his last secret his hidden dragon safe. He swore long ago to never reveal the tattoo or the story to any living soul, and he never has, except once, once on a stormy night, when the rain spattered like ink across the grimy windows and the wind howled through the cracked wood when he told the story to me. It began as an entertaining tale as I leaned on the counter, sipping my poison and watching Ming pummel the face of some quartermaster who had drunkenly slurred a remark from across the bar. Stumbling backwards, the sailor grabbed at Ming's shirt, tearing the front and momentarily revealing Ming's chest. With a roar, Ming caught him under the chin, and the drunkard slumped to the floor. Game over. Ming pulled his shirt back across his shoulders and walked back to his drink. The noise in the bar returned to normal, everyone laughing and continuing their private banter. I was the only one who noticed it. The black serpent scrawled across his heart. A Chinese dragon, its broad tail curling in loops behind it. Long whiskers sprouted from its face like tangles of wet hair. Arming myself with twin barrels of guile and alcohol, I took the seat next to him and offered him several slugs of ambered liquid. He recognized me as one of the regulars and knowingly accepted my offer. Okay, friend, he winked holding out his arms. What story do you want to hear tonight? I pointed my finger at his chest, indicating the hidden serpent curled across his heart. His smile vanished in a flash. With an inscrutable gaze, he stared into my eyes. His heavy lips curled down to a frown, almost a grimace. No good story, he grunted. Forget you've seen it, okay? I was tempted to give up, but noticed he was rocking slightly in his chair. Seizing my chance, I clapped him on the shoulder, telling him not to worry about it, and ordered him several more drinks in the spirit of goodwill. Two hours and a dozen drinks later, he broke. He began to sob quietly into his cup, telling me he was sorry, that he wanted to tell me but swore he wouldn't. With the precision of a surgeon, I knifed across his slurred words and stabbed into his psyche, prodding and poking until he dissolved completely. Closing his eyes, he began the story of the Black Dragon. I'll share it with you here. The old clipper threaded its way across the currents of the South China Sea. With a hole filled with rice, she was bound on a three-week trip to Sydney. Ming, the lines of age not yet etched so deeply into his face, was a simple deckhand on the rusted peeling bucket. The days rolled into nights as Ming performed his duties, his mind locked on their destination. The poor condition of the ship meant it needed a long overhaul and a dry dock when it reached port, granting the crew a long shore leave. The men joked every night around the dim steel cabin about the things they would drink, the places they would go, the woman they would meet. But on the tenth day of the voyage, fate rose its middle finger against the ship and Ming's life. As the morning wore on, a steady breeze from the north quickly built into a typhoon. Waves pounded against the ship as the stinging wind tore across the bow. For the next 30 hours, Ming and the crew struggled against the howling chaos, shifting ballasts and pumping the holds. Each man put their own ounce of strength into saving the clipper and ultimately his own life. 
Two of the crew were torn from the deck and swallowed by the storm. At long last, there was nothing left to do but sit in the dark cabin and beg Poseidon for mercy. The crew awoke to a cloudless sunrise, the sun once again tranquil and flat. Walking outside, they surveyed the damage. The rudder had been torn free and the engine block destroyed. The ship was adrift. The cargo hold had been flooded, the cargo lost. Even worse, the crashing waves had reached over the boat and sheared off the communication tower. Without radio or navigation, low on food and fresh water, the crippled ship drifted helplessly across the blue expanse. Ming laid prostrated across the metal deck, feeling the sun beat savagely against his body. Three nights ago, the food supplies had run out and water was put on ration. A deckhand had died of an infected wound. Another injured man had escaped slow, lingering death by hanging himself. Morale was low. Even the captain had begun to eye the end of his own pistol. The next night, a light appeared on the horizon. Rescue, cried one of the men to another. They quickly built and lit a signal fire on deck and waved flashlights into the dark, yelling and screaming out to their saviors. Their efforts were successful. The bright light was moving closer. At this point in the story, Ming dropped his voice into a low whisper. The crew's elation only rose as the ship drew near. Soon, a second light could be discerned from under the first. The glow from the ship lit up the dark outlines of the men on the deck. They laughed and shouted, Hello! across the water, but not Ming. Backing away from the light, Ming stumbled down the deck until he reached the cabin. Peering out of the metal porthole, he watched the men slowly realize what he had noticed first. There weren't two lights. There was one light, reflecting off the undisturbed surface of the water. Above, floating high over the waves, the ship glided into view. A dull silver dome, hundreds of meters across, eclipsed the stars as it bore down upon the boat, its underside blazing with the inferno of the sun. A fire of light climbed up the sides of the hole and spilled across the deck, enveloping the crew. Heart hammering, Ming claps below the porthole. Outside, he hears the surprised cries of the men rising above the crackling of the luminous air. A pistol shot rings out, and another. Ming flees across the cabin. Spotting a metal locker, he ducks inside, pulling the door shut. More shots. Then the cries of the men morph into screams and shrieks. Crouched over, Ming peers through the gap along the floor of the locker. Suddenly, the screams stop mid-breath. A spear of light smashes into the boat, the steel hull groaning and twisting. The inferno spreads across the length of the boat, penetrating into the cabin. The light pounces from the gap into Ming's eyes. With a yelp, he falls back. The blaze vanishes. Silence shrouds the ship. Ears ringing and eyes burning, Ming's head reels. He crouches down to peer through the crack again. Nothing. Minutes pass. With short breaths, he slowly reaches up to the latch. But as vision swims back into his clouded eyes and the ringing in his head subsides, he freezes. A soft noise brushes against the cloud of silence. Pit-pat. Half deafened by the hammering of his heart, Ming listens to the stillness outside. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. He leans back down to the slit and peers across the cabin, blinking the darkness out of his eyes. Pit-pat, pit-pat. The gentle disturbance grows louder. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. Struggling to see what lies beyond the upper edge of his vision, he lays his head flat against the metal door. A long black tendril drips down from the darkness above. Pat. Ming nearly cries out, but he swallows it before it escapes his lips. Pit. Wide-eyed, he gazes as the thin legs of some unknown creature gently slaps against the floor. Pat. Cylindrical, an inch wide, the legs end in a knobby stub that flattens as it hits the metal. Pit. The leg stalks back and forth in front of the locker with gentle rustling of disturbed leaves. Pat. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. 
The feet patter as the creature slowly walks the length of the cabin. Pit-pat, pit-pat, pit-pat. The tendrils pause in front of the locker, frozen in fear. Ming watches as they delicately lumber closer. Silence. With a softer sound than before, like the brushing aside of a curtain, unseen arms explore the door of the locker, prodding, searching. A sharp screech of metal and the latch begins to rattle. As the bolt slides open, Ming clamps his eyes shut. A sudden brilliance of light flows in from the gap. A sudden pitter and the latch falls down. Soft footsteps retreating from the cabin. The light disappears. Once again, Ming is left in the blackness. The next morning, he slowly exits the locker and wanders onto the deck. The boat is devoid of life. The deck and cabin are seared glossy black. A wide hole melted through the steel yawns down into the hole below. Quickly, Ming grabs the remaining fresh water and stores it onto the ship's lifeboat, along with the scorched pistol he finds near the railing. With starvation a certainty, he casts away from the clipper, rowing endlessly until its dark shape disappears over the horizon. The next day he's discovered and rescued by an Australian freighter. He rages deliriously, of floating lights, then tendrils of legs that slap and soft rustling in the night. A week later, he explains to an official inquiry that the ship's fuel tank exploded and sunk with all hands but himself. The clipper is never found, and the public's interest fades. Ming moves on with his life. As he finishes his story, he opens his eyes. I'm astonished not to mention doubtful at his vivid account. Still, I can't figure out why he has kept such an incredible tale silent for so long. I ask. He turns towards me, tears rolling down from his wrinkled corners of his eyes. I should not have told you the story, he mumbles. I know tell story, and people stay happy. Annoyed, I grab my hat and rise to leave. Suddenly, he grabs my coat with both hands and pulls me towards his face. The sounds, he cries. I hear them before. I hear them after. My whole life I hear them, but not see them. Now I know. Now I know what stalks in the night outside my window. He waves a finger in front of my face. You hear them too, but you not know what they are. I know. They following you too. Pit pat, pit pat, pit pat, behind you in the shadows. Anguished, he screams, spits, and tears fly from his face. Always, always they watching, watching you from the darkness. Laser Tag, written by Digi Gecko. An old online friend of mine and I got to talking a little while ago, and the subject of his old website came up. It went by Creepy Toys, and it ran from 2007 to 2009 letting users submit stories and pictures of, well, really creepy kid stuff. I was a moderator on the message board, which was its biggest focus. Traffic, much like my friend's interest, tapered off and he moved on, but not before backing up the thousands of posts to his computer. This was old and crappy freeware forum software, and users' postings were only recorded by IP address so all the names in regards to their posts have been lost, other than ours. He sent me a copy of the backups, and I'm going through them, as much as it strains my eyes after a while. It's all database source only. One story in particular, which I vaguely remember, stood out for a reason I will explain at the end. The original poster evidently got a hold of someone's personal writings, or had simply forwarded them from another source. Without going into further detail, here is the post, all cleared up. My therapist asked me to start writing in a journal, or maybe a recollection of past events, whatever I thought was best. A few years ago, I would have thought that writing down my feelings and thoughts was pointless, as would be seeing a therapist in the first place. I thought I got a handle on things on my own, you know, doing the macho act of not asking for outside help. I guess things changed when I saw an old friend a month ago, 
and every explanation and excuse I had come up with and made into my personal reality was thrown out the window. There was a sense of vindication after I'd left that friend's house, but with it came a dreaded truth. I'd never told this story to anyone outside of my childhood friends, and threw my accounts to the local police, who had me repeat it over and over. But only one of us was actually there when it happened, the only one who really saw it. I've never liked talking about myself, but Dr. Strauss said that doing so would be cathartic, a release that I would need to have for any chance at further progression. Before I started my sessions, I would have never bothered. It was only recently that I had put things together and accepted the facts of that day. It was 15 years ago, in the late summer of 1998. I had just graduated middle school and was glad to be getting out of that hellhole, as were a few of my friends. We didn't all go to the same school or were in the same grade, but we all lived in the same neighborhood. It was a nice enough place, not far from the water ports and harbors in Pensacola, Florida, a city tucked in the northwest of the state, right by the Alabama and Georgia borders. As you might imagine, summer was hot and muggy, and the town didn't have too many attractions for kids, so we spent a lot of our time playing video games or going outside to look for something to do often inventing sports or stupid brutish games. We were a group of six boys when we were all together. Our parents all knew each other for the most part, and despite a few rivalries and some fights amongst us over the years, we all got along pretty well, all growing up within a mile of one another. I don't want to say too much about them, because we've all broken apart over the years, and, and I don't know where we've all ended up, or how we dealt with what had happened. The last thing I want to do is have the story somehow go public and get big or something, and then some reporter goes out tracking us down and opening up old wounds that some of us might have healed by now. Anyway, here are some of the first names and some overly generalized description of their personalities. Just please remember that these were actual people, not cartoon characters when whatever douchebag gets a hold of this journal and decides to make a movie out of it. I guess I've become a little paranoid over the years. First, there's me, Justin. You'll find out enough about me through this story, so I won't bother sharing anything about myself here. Brian was our group's only black kid, and he was always fairly mellow. Just kind of followed us around wherever we were with few hesitations. I didn't know his parents well, but they must have raised him something proper. The few times we went out to act like little teenage bastards, he would always only watch us, never knocking over garbage cans or vandalizing anything. Not that any of that was ever my idea. No, those boredom-killing brain farts were strictly externalized from Devon. He looked like a bully, but he never was actually mean to anyone, as bossy as he could be. He was the biggest of the group, but not terribly overweight. I think he must have had ADHD growing up, and he was always getting into trouble, often dragging us right down with him. Gilbert. I swear to God that was his name. And yes, he caught a lot of flack for it. He was the nerdy one, the only kid with glasses. He was damn smart, but overly technical for his age. It was a miracle he never got socked by any of us after he finished listening to one of our conversations and then interjected some facts with an intake of mucus followed by a raised index finger and an annoying, actually. But then again, he was smart and creative and could come up with some good jokes on the fly because of it. Then we have the fraternal twins, Peter and Nick. Not terribly interesting names, but at least their parents decided to not be asshats and give them something cute and stupid like Bobby and Robbie. They only looked a little alike, and Peter was always about an inch taller than his brother. They both had dirty blonde hair and matching blue eyes. But that's where the similarities ended. Peter was energetic and into sports, and was a bit of a loudmouth. Nick was pretty quiet, and he never seemed to be very good at anything we tried, other than video games. He could kick our collective asses in mostly any genre. I was always a casual gamer, preferring to spend my time outside and only rent games from the nearby video library, all gone now. But I did have several systems. The one among us subscribed to several gaming magazines. Nick was typically the kid to introduce us to the latest hot title. From the day it came out and we all went to the twins' house to play it. 
We had all been addicted for the past year to Goldeneye for the Nintendo 64. It was real hot stuff back then. The talk of the class's guys whenever the topic of video games came up. Playing it automatically made you cool. The game led to many late night sleepovers, sometimes lasting until the first morning light in the summer. We played other things, of course. Mostly Mortal Kombat and Mario Kart, but the epic James Bond shooter was the crown jewel. Four player games were awesome. Ten minutes of shooting each other in the face and being blown up with mines and rocket launchers. The two lowest scoring players would trade with the two spectators of the previous game, and those watching for a round would usually go scrounge for soda and snacks. They were good times for us, and sharing the game together put a few inventive thoughts into our minds for a new game of our own. We still had to do something during the daylight hours that we would rather spend outside. After I threw out the idea of a real-life first-person shooter, we quickly came up with the idea of a game simply called Guns. The name really showed how creative we could be. It started as an advanced game of hide-and-seek. After a few free-for-all rounds, we ended up splitting into two or sometimes even three teams was more fun. This sounds kind of lame, I know, but the game's origins had us running and hiding and setting up ambushes along the three main blocks of the neighborhood. The goal was to sneak up on someone, point your hand out in the shape of a gun, and yell bang before the other guys could react. Then he was dead and had to go wait in the KIA zone. Sometimes, though, we captured them instead and had him turn on his team. Going indoors was against the rules, as was going into anyone else's property other than our own yards. Still, the neighborhood provided a full landscape. Cars, fences, trees, and bushes all became barricades. Sometimes we'd even climb into the branches to hide, waiting for our prey to get close. Since you could contest a distant hit as a miss, the closer you could fire, the more likely the other kid is to admit their death. And hiding was as important as sneaking around. The backdrop of Brian's dad's pickup truck was a particularly good place to hide. Many lives were claimed in his driveway. To keep things fresh, the game evolved quickly. Walkie-talkies were soon used to let teams separate and keep in communication with other ones. We made up more pretend weapons than just hand pistols. Like the long-range arm rifle and an invisible rapid-fire machine gun. But it was dawning on us how ridiculous it was starting to look. Especially to the passerby jogger, or the dog walker, the civilians we shared the neighborhood with. So we started trying other guns but nothing worked quite as well as our simpleton phantom weapons. Water guns were nice on a hot day, and we once tried out water balloons as grenades. If the splash hit you, you were dead. But the range was of course poor. And if you forgot to pump it, you'd just end up with a little sad trickle of water that couldn't reach your target. After which they'd spray you back amid a laugh or two. It was kind of cool finding sources of water around the blocks for refills though. Ammo caches. The one time we tried nerf guns ended in a resounding failure. Not only was their range also poor, but we lost half the darts we fired. Like water guns, these were toys meant for running around like an idiot in the backyard. That wasn't what we wanted. We liked the thrill of the hunt, the team play, the ambushes, the double crosses, the crushing defeat, the strategy. We had to perfect our game somehow with something better. I should mention that Nick and I took the whole thing a little more seriously than the others. If having Gilbert on your team gave you a strategist, Devin provided you a fearless berserker, Brian a patient soldier who could hide for long periods of time, and Peter your jack-of-trades grunt. Then Nick and I, who were average at best, wanted a different role. We were the game masters. We set up the rules and began to map out entire levels within the neighborhood, complete with boundaries. A few times we even hid little flags around that, if held, gave you power-ups like a second life or 10 seconds of invisibility once you held it and declared it, letting someone slip past enemy fire unharmed. Guns filled up much of our summer. It was like we were programmers and beta testers to a virtual reality game, but it still lacked a solid set of armaments. We didn't need to get too technical and introduce things like having to reload, but 
We did want something that had a long, precise range that would not only bring out our true individual skills, but also got rid of the time-wasting, Nuh-uh, you didn't hit me, arguments resulting from fired, invisible bang bullets. On my birthday, we made a reservation for the Fun Center, where I sometimes played mini-golf with my parents. It was a pretty cool place with arcade machines, prizes, and even a go-kart track. I think a lot of kids have grown up near and frequent in similar venues. Last time I was there, I realized that they had a laser tag arena. That was something we had to try. I had also investigated paintball by this point, but figured that we were a bit too young for that. And I didn't like the idea of only having some boring backwoods to play in, or strapping on all that gear. I also feared the pain that would come from being hit, though I'm sure my stupid childish fear was exaggerated, of course. On top of that, you had to pay to play. We liked our freedom to play however long we wanted to in our neighborhood, as crappy as our gear was. But I figured laser tag was worth a try. It wasn't that costly. I walked out of our 15-minute session disappointed. It wasn't terrible by any means, but I expected much more. The indoor arena was made out of crappy plywood forts and was lit with black lights and glowing star stickers. The obnoxiously loud techno music really removed the element of strategy, since we couldn't hear ourselves talk, much less into our enemy's footsteps in the small arena. Still, it did introduce me to laser guns. The few times anyone managed to score a hit, their vests would light up and buzz loudly. The guns even made realistic sounds and felt, well, real in our young teenage hands. We may have spent most of our time in the chamber, running around like idiots trying to learn how to play, but my heart was still pumping throughout the game. What was the most awesome was just how accurate the things were, and the very idea of shooting an invisible light at a target across the room and hitting them instantly and assuredly. This was just mind-blowingly cool for us. Now would be a good time to emphasize that none of us were gun nuts. I don't think any of our parents even owned any. And out of the six of us, only Gilbert, somewhat ironically, I guess you could call it, joined the military, though I don't think it was a position where he actually had to hold a weapon. It was just a phase for us, another cool thing that would have run its course eventually. However long guns might have fulfilled our needs, we knew it was always going to be fun while it lasted. I was only a kid, the other five had at least one sibling, and that meant that I relied on my friends for human contact and my parents spoiled me dad especially. I wasn't some needy little tool who had to have the newest thing and a lot of it. I could restrain myself, but it always seemed that when it came time that I did ask for something, my dad would give it to me in spades, like no expense was too great, and he had always was eager to please. I wanted my own set of laser guns to surprise the guys with, so one Friday night, we headed out to Target to see what we could find. It took some looking in their big toy section, since I wasn't sure what aisle guns would be in, but sure enough, they had what I was looking for in stock. On the shelves on the back wall past the aisle with micro machines, I missed those, I used to collect them, it was a brightly colored box with some stupidly happy boys on it, one of them holding a comically oversized gun, the other smiling idiotically as he was shot in the back. I was already sold. The toys were called Laser Challenge, and were expensive, maybe $40 each, but dad was happy that I was so earnestly excited about the things. I didn't even know that they existed before we went looking, figuring that laser tag guns might have been restricted to places like the Fun Center. He bought four sets, each of us carrying two boxes up to the checkout. The problem was that they only had four in stock, four groups of guns, vests, and backpacks total. He knew well as I did that I needed two more sets if all six of us were going to be playing. Dad found out about our game not long after we started, and though Mom was a little bit worried that I was being indoctrinated by gun culture, Dad just laughed it off. That's just the way she was. Boys will be boys, right? And as long as I was getting outside and getting exercise, they were both happy. I made my grievances known as we got back to the car, knowing that I was just stating the obvious. Dad promised that he would get me another two sets, suggesting that we should test them out first anyways in a four-player game. He was being nice enough to buy them for me in the first place, 
so I ended up agreeing with them. Two of the boys would just have to sit out our first couple of games, or maybe act as unarmed scouts or spies. But on the way home, we saw the local Goodwill store. Dad and I traded glances, each knowing what the other was thinking. Mom got some of her dresses from the store, and Dad would bring home some quirky little handmade things whenever he stopped by. But I never found much interest there, and I didn't like the feel or idea of secondhand stuff. Despite that, I knew that it was worth a look. Maybe they even had another set, or two for cheap. It was late by then, near closing time from what I remember, and the checkout lines were filled with shoppers, many of them mothers with bored kids their arms full of worn and faded clothes. Just for fun, I checked out the video game section first, but most of the games were still from last generation. Since they weren't what I was here for anyways, I hurriedly guided my dad to the back where the used toys were. I always hated the smell there, the one of mildew and dirty diapers, so I didn't want to stay long. We looked around for a bit, but the toy section was so small that much of its space was intruded upon by an old VCR and crappy televisions playing Disney movies on loop. It became quite obvious that our search was fruitless, but again, I wasn't too disappointed. I was happy with what I had for now. As we turned to head out and return home, I noticed a black cardboard box hanging out just a little behind an ugly teal shelf littered with broken corpses of stuffing spewing teddy bears. I was going to leave it be figuring it was just a moldy toy tomb by now. But then I saw the shape of a gun on the box's side. Was this really what I thought it was? I rushed up to it and pulled it out with some effort as it was snug between the shelf and the wall. My reaction upon pulling it out and looking at the cover was unmitigated joy, like it was suddenly Christmas morning. The first thing I saw were two handguns held by a pair of admittedly badass but typical 80s white kids, holding them upright like they were spies. And the guns didn't even need to be overly stylized like the laser challenger ones in any way. They spoke for themselves. The box was solid black, except for the photo cut out on the front of the two kids. A swirling James Bond gun barrel that ended in the white circle behind them. Sure, it was a clear knockoff image, but... It naturally excited me even further, given that Goldeneye was still my video game goddess at the time, and the guns were depicted accurately, positioned in the use hands at an angle to show as much detail as possible. The box's paint was chipped in spots all across it, and the cover was especially faded, but it still looked pretty damn cool. I wondered what lucky kids this must have passed on to over the years. Judging by its look, I had to guess that it was quite old. I was right. In the corner, I saw the copyright year of 198. The last digit had been replaced by raw cardboard, where the paint was completely gone. But the age of the product didn't bother me too much. I remember wondering, even back then, that a set of laser guns from the 80s must have been quite pioneering. These had to have been expensive once. I opened the box and saw the quality put into the toys. The cover didn't lie. Better yet, there were two pairs of guns and frontal hit detection vests. Held firmly in an oversized styrofoam mold, indicative of the past decade's environmental lack of foresight, I pried one of the guns out. It was small, but it had some real weight to it, and the build quality was quite good. It was made of strong, solid black plastic and had a few metal trimmings purely for aesthetic to make it look like a toy. The tip of the barrel where the laser was fired out of was also made of this metal, as was the trigger and the iron sights. It quickly occurred to me how dangerously real this thing looked. A sharp contrast to the orange and gray laser challenge weapons. If it weren't for the swirling metal bedazzle around the edges, that gave them a more juvenile appearance. Someone was just asking to get shot by cops waving these around. By this point, Dad had come over giving me an impressed, Whoa, what did you find? He knelt down to the floor to examine the set for himself, and then noticed something on the gun that I was holding. He pointed it out for me, and I was surprised I hadn't seen it yet. On the back of the iron sights were two green glowing dots. They didn't blink, or waver when set at different angles like normal LEDs. Furthermore, there was no on or off switch for them, 
or the gun itself, or battery compartments anywhere. These things were solid, sturdy creations that could have been easily mistaken for real guns, and we couldn't even tell how they were powered. Neither my dad or I knew what to make of the external lights, but we did think that they were kinda cool. I would learn much later in life that the lights were made of tritium, a radioactive element used for illumination on some real guns and watches, or other equipment that might, for whatsoever reason, need a constant but small source of light. Tritium is safe, at least for radioactive material, but it was still an element that sheds its atoms. When I found out about it later in life and researched it, I also learned that it was a key component in nuclear weapons. Had either of us realized such ominous facts about some material used in a damn child's toy, I knew my dad would have never bought it. The vests looked a little more friendly, although the problem was that they only had frontal sensor boxes, no backpacks like the American units. Their bodies were made of plastic and had a single black circle in the middle where the incoming laser was detected. Four leather straps were attached to the back of the device, held onto it with old metal buckles, which were another sign of the toy's age. I hadn't seen any toys made of this kind of metal that rusts since I was a little kid, and that's exactly what the buckles were made of. They had weathered into ugly brown husks, their metal components grinding against one another and producing iron dust. But they were only parts of the entire set that hadn't aged well, and the rest of it was high quality, if not slightly creepy in that kind of old, strange industrial toy way. Dad noticed that the back of the sensor units were made of a thin layer of solid flat metal, and there was a noticeable latch. He popped it open fairly effortlessly, and reacted quickly to catch the large battery that dropped out. It looked familiar, like the six bolt battery used on one of my dad's emergency flashlights, but it was solid blue, no wording at all and the bulk was distributed differently. It was fatter, wider than the kind of oversized battery that I was used to. Inside the shell, I also noticed a small dial, but I didn't touch it yet. Dad put the battery back in and closed the hatch. He told me that he had a hunch that this thing wasn't made in America and wanted to see the front cover. I flipped it over and noticed something that I should have noticed earlier. The words, even the product name, weren't in English. It was a language that I wasn't familiar with, almost alien to me. But my dad, older and wiser, identified it as Arabic. I thought that it was strange, since the box art looked so American. I was disappointed again, believing that the laser gun toy from a different country wouldn't work with the other sets, and I breathed out an audible sigh. Dad noticed it and quickly cheered me up a little again when he pointed out something on the box. It was poorly translated, but it was English. In one corner were the humorous but promising words, work with many type. Seeing how much I liked the toy already, Dad told me to wait a moment. He left the store and came back in after a minute, one of the laser challenger pistols in his hand. He flicked a switch on the foreign set vests, making the black circle light up with a monotone chime. A few dozen red LEDs were behind the clear plastic, though a few had burned out. He gave the toy pistol a test fire at point blank, aiming straight at the hit zone. It worked, much to my delight. The vest fired out a small digitized buzz and one fourth of the lights disappeared. After a second hit, another fourth went dark. Dad looked as if he'd figured out something and opened the hatch again to show me something. The vest had a hit point system and the dial could control how much damage a single hit could do. By turning it all the way to four, a single shot removed all the quadrants of the health circle. It was a cool feature, but as we always played one hit kills, I knew that this would be keeping it all the way up. It wasn't as if our American sets had that option anyways. The last thing I took note of was that the middle of the target circle was a slightly bigger red dot, which had a flat head, unlike the dome tops of the other lights. Its color was also a bit darker, as if it was wearing out. Both vests were identical in this regard, so I paid it little mind. We couldn't find a sheet of instructions anywhere, and my dad still had some hesitations, although the system did seem to work fine. We tested all the guns and vests, and dad even went back to his car a second time to fetch one of the cheap plastic hitboxes from the other set, 
that had what looked like the orange traffic barricade lights for their sensors. Again, everything was cross compatible. It looked like it was a done deal once we found the faded peeling price tag. It was $20 for the complete set. It seemed like a really good bargain. This is where you might expect the person ringing us up to see the object in question and say something cryptic or give us a frightful, glad to have this out of here look. But the old lady at the register was clearly tired and ready to go home. And any other time, she probably wouldn't have known anything about the toy in any case. Dad paid for it and we were out of the store just as it was closing. The next Saturday, I knew it would be awesome. When the gang got all together at the twins' house after lunch, I revealed the sets, and they were excited by the whole idea of having our own laser guns. The foreign sets, of course, took the spotlight over the regular American ones. Brian suggested that we do some rock, paper, scissors to see who would get to use them, but after a debate, in the end, I claimed one of them, having been the one to find them. We had to compensate a bit since the foreigns didn't have the backpack units, making sneak attacks from the rear impossible on its wearers. This would be a huge disadvantage to the others, so we simply kept the American set's rear hit packs inside. It was sort of lame only being able to land an official hit on someone's front side, which meant waiting for them to simply turn around to actually kill them if you were stalking behind them, but we would deal with it. Nick was a little offended at first, after I explained the reason he should get the other. He usually died first, the most often, and was a lousy shot. Quite an accomplishment, considering the accuracy of an imagined slugs. But his brother Peter agreed with his handicap, and with that, we were off for a day of team death matches around the neighborhood. Yell and Brian were in my team the first time, and we kicked ass with a solid score of 3-0. After that, I took Nick and Devin, so both of our old sets were on a single team. Devin got taken down, but Nick and I were untouchable by a long-range ambush that took place on one of the block's curves. That was the first indication that these old sets were really higher of quality, or at least more powerful than the others. While Devin shot three or four times before he was hit, none of them made an impact on Peter, Brian, and Gil. But the guns that Nick and I had took out the entire team, one right after the other, after we took a second to steady our aim. After a third game, we realized that having two boys with old sets on one team gave them an unfair advantage. Having skimmed through the manual for the American toys, I remember how the sunlight could interfere with the laser. That made sense, but it also seemed like the advertised 200 feet range was also a lie in the first place, as Gil had reported that he had to get within 50 feet or so to land a hit with his gray plastic gun. The black ones, however. We took a break to figure out their range to do a few fuel tests, having Brian back up about 10 feet until Peter's hit with the black gun no longer could register. He had to clear across the block, some 500 feet away, and even in the direct sunlight, until his vest stopped buzzing. We all thought once again about how cool these things were, but I was a bit unsettled. They felt too powerful, as if they were industrial lasers embedded into the black guns that kids should have no business playing with. What if we hit someone in the eye? But to the others, the pistols had basically turned into sniper rifles. Sure, we still had to be accurate at long range, but we could still land a hit from much further away than seemed normal. The discovery of the foreign set abilities changed the game's dynamic. Suddenly, Nick and I were deemed permanent squad leaders. We were the specialists, meant to be feared. That was when Peter started asking me to switch up gear with him. I told him he could have my set tomorrow, but after a few more games, he started whining and complaining about it. At three o'clock, we broke for snacks, soda, and water to replenish ourselves. We had played long and hard so far, and the other people in the neighborhood had taken notice of our antics, but we were having too much fun to notice or care what they thought of us. Being a nice guy, I relented and told Peter he could have my set for the next round of games that would last until we would call it an evening. He had the best aim, and a mechanical little grin spread across his face, as he no doubt wondered what it would be like pulling off miracle shots as a professional sniper. The thing was though, Nick and I couldn't get the vest off. We tried everything, but the buggles were just oddly configured little things. We couldn't even tell if we were pressing the right thing down on them, or if we had to wiggle them a certain way 
or if it was the friction caused by the rust that locked them in place. We eventually gave up and had our indoor snack break with them still on, looking like dorks, somewhat to the amusement of the others. Even though I couldn't get my vest off, I still traded guns with Peter. That seemed good enough for him. Holding the cheap gray plastic in my hand, I knew it would take a little while to get used to its limitations. As the day wore on and cooled a bit while the sun was setting, I started taking my first hits without the advantage of long range, and I really began to notice the strange quirks of the vest. For one, it was really uncomfortable. The leather straps that went over my shoulders and around my stomach would have been more comfortable if they weren't so tied. On top of this, the metal plate on the backside of the hit detection unit, pressed tightly against my skin, was cold, never warming to my body's temperature. Also, once I took a hit for the first time, I could feel a small tingle of electricity come from the back plate. It was really small, however less than that of a static shock. I didn't even notice it most of the time, but it was there. I couldn't tell if it was deliberate, like some sort of failing impact feedback, or more like something bigger, being contained but leaking out ever so slightly each time a laser strand was close enough to be detected by my front circle. But the oddest thing of all were the power lines nearby. They were old and buzzed often in cycles, but whenever I drew near them, they seemed to buzz louder or start buzzing if they were quiet at the time. I had learned about electrical fields in science class that last year of middle school and thought that something in the hitbox might have caused some sort of interference, but I didn't really think about how powerful the battery would have to be to do such a thing. I did, however, begin to feel unsafe hauling it around. And thinking back, I suddenly remembered the moment my dad had turned it on for the first time, in the store. I thought nothing of it back then, but when he did that, the fluorescent light above us flickered, just briefly. I had grown up with the fear of electricity. Outlets had always scared the crap out of me as a kid. As if simply touching any part of it would electrocute me. A gut feeling told me something was wrong with this toy. I now wish I had said something, or called off the game completely. After the first game following snacks, when I let the other team use both the black guns, we got creamed. Peter gave us his brother, Nick, to even the score. He joined Devin and I, and after the 60 second countdown that we used to get the team separated from one another, we headed out, deciding to go on patrol instead of making a base this time, as Devin never liked to sit around and wait for the opposition to find us. Peter's team must have been doing a good job at hiding because we could never find them after two sweeps of the block. We looked behind every one of our houses, covered the adjacent block, and still find no sign of them. It was a good idea to separate the team a bit, so it wasn't taken down in a single ambush. But I always hated breaking up completely and going on patrol alone. But Peter and his sneaky bastard gang wanted to play things this way, so we had little choice but to separate and cover more ground. I checked to make sure that Devin and Nick had their walkie-talkie set to the proper channels, and we headed our separate ways. Now alone, my senses heightened. I could feel the beads of sweat on my forehead, and hear the faint buzzing of the drooping power lines. It was quiet, and the air was still. Everyone else in the neighborhood had gone inside. Getting tired of the round, I started walking down the middle of the streets, putting myself in the open. If someone moved to take a shot at me, I might react in time. Maybe not. It was, after all, just a game, and I was growing impatient and wanted them to come out. I got my wish as I walked down the empty street just in front of my house. Brian let out of some bushes, took aim at me, and fired. I heard the buzzing, felt the tingle, and looked down to see the red lights disappear. Proud of his kill, Brian smiled and walked over to me. Despite being a bit pissed off that his team decided to hide like little wussies, I still thought up a little compliment to give him, but it never left my mouth. Just as he stepped in front of me, I heard a loud pop in the distance. It sounded electrical, like a transformer had just blown. At the same time, our two walkie-talkies let out a loud but brief burst of static. Brian and I looked around, maybe expecting to see sparks raining down from a power pole or something. We waited for a few minutes, still out in the open. Brian staying with me despite being on the opposite team. The pop had taken us out of the game, startled us. We eventually settled down again and got ready to part ways. Brian backed into a hiding spot, 
myself to the dead zone. But then, God, that horrible smell. I knew what it was. I think everyone does. That stinging stench of an electrical burn. It's similar to dust burning off into the heater. But whereas the aroma is almost pleasant in a way, an electrical burn is a threatening smell you never want to experience. The last time I had was when our microwave practically exploded last year, which was unpleasant. With the possibility of a fire being nearby, we dropped the game and using Brian's walkie-talkie tried to get in touch with Peter and Gil. We got no response the first few times we tried to contact them, but on the fifth try, some feedback suggested that someone on the other end was holding down the transponder button. No one on the other end spoke, but we could still hear something. Brian had to turn up the volume all the way to hear it. Faint sobbing. Worried for our friends, we ran off together, scouring the neighborhood. It took us 10 minutes to see Devin who had spotted us first and was waving us down from the edge of the borderline of the playing field, the farthest possible sidewalk on the last block of the neighborhood. Stepping out onto the road from it made you dead, at least if anyone else were to see you do it. We rushed over to him and saw Gil examining the sharp incline by the side of the road, where a storm drain feeds runoff water down into a ditch-like area that was often muddy. It was also overgrown with weeds and vines that climbed up the nearby cedar trees, which condensed into a little ugly forest typically occupied by drunks and garbage. For reasons we never really understood, this area on the edge of the battlefield was Nick's favorite hiding spot. He would sometimes still be in the ditch, eyes peeking out at street level after the entire team was already dead. Next to Gil was Peter, in a way I'd never seen him before. He was in a state of shock, rocking back and forth very gently in a fetal position. I asked everyone what had happened, but Gil wasn't around at the time and knew nothing about it. Peter had yet to say a word. Nick was nowhere in sight. I tried to coax an answer from Peter, but he just looked back at me with saucer eyes. When I started shaking him and demanding to know what had happened, he murmured something. But it was so quiet. He might as well have just mouthed something, it was so silent. To this day, however, the closest thing that I could think of as to what he would have said is, I saw him. I shot him. My stomach dropped. Peter didn't give me a straight answer, but I still had a deep and increasing worry that something terrible had happened to Nick, that maybe the hitbox had electrocuted him. It was morbid, but that's the conclusion my mind had instantly leapt to. Gil, Brian, Devin, and I searched the area, sinking into the mud on occasion. I sniffed the air, smelling the electrical burn again. Every second that passed by that we didn't find Nick in pain or worse was a small relief, but we didn't find a trace of him at all until we started heading back to Peter. Hidden in some of the overgrowth on the incline, their red color was now distinguishable in the grass, were Nick's shoes. Gil looked closer at them, but when he tried to pick them up, Peter suddenly shouted, Don't touch them! Gil abided by the request. Panic overtook the four of us that were still in reality, and we quickly ran to Devon's house, the closest to our current position, and told his parents. They finally called the police when we managed to convince them that we weren't pulling a prank, and that we couldn't really find Nick. The rest of the day was hell, but at least it went by quickly. The police arrived, as did everyone's parents. Peter's father took him home as he was too traumatized to help the officers in any way. As more cops arrived, we explained everything about what we were doing. One of the cops even mentioned how he had noticed us earlier that day while on patrol. A search party started around sunset, and all the while we stuck outside in the heat, sweating like crazy on the side of the road as our hearts raced. The police had little to go on and no witnesses other than Peter, who they knew they would need to talk to right away. I was the first one to suggest to them to find the hit sensor box and gun from the laser set. That made them a little curious. I explained the device as much as I could, even the tingling I felt. They may have concluded that the toy sounded dangerous, but still, it was just a toy. Nevertheless, they decided to take the foreign set into further investigation. I had no arguments. 
After what might have happened to Nick, I wanted nothing to do with that set anymore. Or for that matter, laser tag or guns. I knew the game, and whatever form it could have taken after this day was now tainted. They quickly found Peter's gun, dropped in the tall grass right by where he had been sitting. Nick was discovered soon after, not far from his shoes. But even with their help, I couldn't get my vest off. That damn thing felt like it was permanently strapped to my body. It finally took Devin's father bringing a pair of metal shears from his garage to get the hitbox off of me, and he had to work to cut through the thick leather straps. But at least I was free. Safe. The police took the device and began their search for the other. Only, like Nick, they never found it. Over the following weeks, they combed the entire area for both the hitbox and its wearer, even dredged up mud to see if it sunken into it. I began to have visions of it exploding into a bright nuclear fireball, vaporizing Nick, but I kept the nightmares to myself. The twins' parents must have suffered more than I did, and I knew it was my fault. Despite all the assurances that day and the ones that followed from the police, Nick was never found. His disappearance made the local news and then the state news. No suspects were ever named. Every time I walked by that missing child board in Walmart, I saw his face, haunting me, staring at me above the description and the number to call. I saw that poster hanging for years, until I went off to college and left my old town and friends behind, all of which were irrevocably shattered by the incident. In my senior year, I came out for winter break. By now, I had invented that reality that I mentioned earlier. I shoved the idea of the laser tag toy killing him out of my mind, coming to believe, like the town did, that Nick had just ended up as another vanished or abducted child that would never return. Coming home, I had flashbacks of his funeral, two years after he had disappeared, where I was unable to look at his parents or Peter in the eye from across Nick's empty casket. The past didn't stay dead. When I came home, my mother told me, in a shallow voice, that Peter had been calling recently, asking me every other day. She told me that I should go see him. I didn't want to, but of course I had to. I walked over to his house, where he still lived with his parents. The place had gone to hell. The paint was peeling off, the grass was so tall that trees could have begun sprouting. And once I was let in, the smell of alcohol was nearly overpowering. With as much motivation as a zombie, Peter's dad rejoined his wife on the couch, where they both lifelessly watched the television. Even eight years later, Nick's death had left a scar on the household. I trudged upstairs and into a dirty, crowded mess of what was once a big living room. The place would have fit right in on an episode of Hoarders, and there was a foreboding detail. Buried under a trash bag of beer cans that was blocking the television, I could see a Nintendo 64 on the floor. As crazy as it sounds, it must have been unused ever since that day, as Nick's golden eye copy was still plugged into it. This place reeked of despair. I desperately wanted to leave, but if Peter wanted to talk, if he had answers, then I had to meet with him. He was in his room, also a disaster area. Empty energy drink cans lined the floor. I could see that he had grown an unruly beard before he had turned around in his computer chair. After exiting some MMORPG I was unfamiliar with, I greeted him as kindly as possible. I could see his sadness in his sunken eyes, but what he was really hiding was his anger. When he spoke to me, it was in a way that I could only describe as restrained barks. He must have had nothing but hatred for me, which I didn't blame him for that he was struggling to control. Suddenly, he started laying everything out there, getting it off his chest at long last. His parents had been sending him to a therapist for eight years since that day, and he said that while she helped, he was making slow progress. He had hated the bitch inside, because she didn't believe him when he shared his accounts of the event. He then told me that he had just started going to a psychiatrist and hoped that he would believe him. Understanding his anger and now feeling nothing but pity, I talked with him calmly and reasonably. He eventually did relax some after getting out all the content he had for me. 
He took a big breath and his whole body shuddered, as if in anticipation of the forthcoming grand revelation. That was just what I got, as much as it hurt. The truth, at last, and that dreaded vindication I mentioned at the start of the story. I never returned to his house that day to retrieve the box, assuming the police would take it. But I watched, as Peter reached deep under his bed, the space looking like an unnavigable garbage dump, and he pulled out the black box that I had seen in my dreams many times. He took off the rotted, moist cover, a smell of mold exploding from the inside, but it was what he took out of the box that made me truly sick to my stomach. It was the missing hit sensor box. Only the frontal plastic shell had been clearly warped and scarred by extreme heat. It had partially melted over the black circle in the middle, and the leather straps were charred. Holding back vomit, Peter almost gleefully flipped the device over, as if in his damaged mind that I supposed to like what he was showing me. The metal back had mostly survived intact, but there was a large dent in the middle where it made contact with the battery. The hinge, however, no longer locked in place, and the back plate swung open, freely to reveal the interior of the shell. There was no sign of the battery itself. Its compartment was a solid black, and there seemed to be a dried remnant of battery acid. I could only surmise that the battery had exploded in its entirety. However much energy it had inside must have been incredibly lethal. Justin, Peter suddenly shouted at me, snapping me out of my daze, sickly stupor. He then proceeded to call me an idiot repeatedly for not reading the instructions. I whimpered in reply, telling him I didn't see any. In one broad stroke, Peter tore out the styrofoam which I noticed had already been broken into several pieces. Under what remained of the fractured white block was a thin yellow pamphlet. The guns were printed in black and white on the cover. Now both terrifying and racking me with guilt, he began to shove the moldy instruction book in my face, thrusting it until it was a few inches in front of my eyes. Each time he turned a page as he yelled at me to read. Although I was shaking, I tried my best to do so. Most of the instructions were in Arabic, but there were a little warning box labeled with exclamation points and a triangle that were in multiple languages, including French, Spanish, and English. Every page had an image of proper use, the boys from the box cover demonstrating various ways of hitting one another with lasers, or simply how to attach the equipment. Other than a few instances of radioactive trefoil symbol, the warning seemed innocuous at first. Don't aim at the eyes, take a break from playing sometimes, don't use it in the rain, etc. I told Peter that I didn't understand what went wrong. I knew enough by this point that he had figured out what had killed Nick, and he had hidden his brother's vest in the box. I told him I was very sorry, but again that I didn't understand. Before he showed me the last page, Peter said he kept the burnt, twisted vest so he could figure out what had happened on his own. Maybe he thought the police wouldn't be able to. I can't hope to know. Calmer now, he turned to the last page and handed me the book. My stomach churned again. The warning was simple, and like the rest of the product, poorly translated, Danger. Critical hit zone. These words were under a diagram of the black hit circle where an arrow pointed to the smaller center light, and there was a descriptive image of one of the boys shooting the other, a demonic smile and a look of victory on his face, as he so happily sent the other boy from the box cover into oblivion. The other boy who was screaming out in raw pain and terror as his vest exploded and his body turned into fine particles of ash. But Peter wasn't done. He had one last thing to show me, as he reached for the top of the bookcase in his room. I noticed the faint scratch marks of the metal backing of the destroyed hitbox. It looked like someone had taken a screwdriver to it in order to violently scrape something off. Peter showed me a small corked plastic vial that he had taken off his shelf. Inside was solid black gathering of what appeared to be soot. He gave me a sickening smile and told me, It's been a long time since you've seen Nick, hasn't it? Say hi to Nick. I felt myself heave and hit the floor, but nothing came up. My mind scrambled trying to accept what I had just seen and was told. 
to imagine the fear, the pain, as my friend burned up into ash so small that it blew away into the light wind, killed by his own brother, Eagle Eye Peter, who had scored a critical. Before I turned and ran out of the house, Peter, holding what was left of his twin brother, had some advice. I'd see a therapist, Justin. It'll help. There. I got it all down. Happy, Dr. Strauss? Whether or not anyone reads this, I don't care anymore. Maybe in time, recording what actually happened will help me. I don't know. What do I know? Is that for an entire day I carried around what I assumed was some sick, perverted Eastern European toy maker's idea of a fun game for the kitties. A walking time bomb, waiting for the bulls I hit. How all of its previous owners managed to miss, I have no idea. If you decide to hunt down another set for some sick dark fantasy and you're stupid enough to buy it after reading this journal that some asshole stole and posted online, try not to play with anyone else whose shot is worth a damn. There was no telling what was real or what was made up on the Creepy Toys forum. I think that was when I first read this post, I dismissed it as another made up story. But I kind of did like the Cold War industrial atomic toy aspect of it. It turns out that it had a final reply that I never saw, made just hours before the forum was shut down permanently. I don't think many, if any members saw this post before the site was no more. Here it is below. Hello, I am posting from Poland. I have a good grasp on English. The box you described sounds much like the one I saw in my neighbor's attic. He was a collector of strange things. His box was in very good condition with the year of 1986. It still had the original instructions and I too have seen the image of the boy shooting the other, blowing him up. What a terrifying child toy. It's impossible to say who made it as there's no company name on the box. So it would be very difficult to find how many were made. The language on the box and most of the instructions is certainly Belrusian. I wish I could tell you more about the product, but sadly, even as the collector, his box is missing the actual weapons and vests. How strange that a full set would make it all the way to a thrift store in America. I hope therapy gets you through this time in your life. Take care.